Okay, so we're going to basically do um, sort of a, a expedition update, if you will, um, which we wanted to start with just showing again the goals of this ex expedition. Sometimes we just show these as sort of three, but we're making it a little more uh, expanded now to show sort of six different goals that were in our original proposal for why uh, we basically got funded to go drill into the Chicxulub impact. Um, and the first is that it's the best preserved large impact crater on Earth because it's only 66 million years ago, and the other two of comparable size are two billion years old. So this is an opportunity to get you know, fresh samples of, fresh being geologically relevant, um, samples of uh, an impact um, that would allow us to understand how impact cratering works as a process, understand how it, it, it affects planetary evolution, um, and that immediately leads to goal number two, which is to understand how rocks are physically weakened during an impact uh, cratering event to allow them to create these sort of final crater structures that are wide, flat things and don't look anything like a bowl you might expect from you know, a rock hitting a, hitting a target, for instance. So we, we have some um, results from that that have been published that we're going to expound upon a little bit. Um, the next goal was uh, the recovery of life at ground zero, basically, recovery of life right at the uh, location that caused 75% uh, of, of the world to, uh, world's organisms to go extinct at the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary. Um, the fourth is, um, can impact craters be a habitat for life? You know, is there, is there the right recipe of uh, porosity in the subsurface of fluid flow um, and of energy and chemistry to make them suitable habitats for life, thinking back towards the concept of how did life start on Earth and are impact crater events potentially a good place to get life going? Um, and that's very related to the fifth bullet point, which is um, what kind of and for how long um, do we observe uh, hydrothermal systems being generated by large impacts? Um, because we think that life starts on Earth as a thermophilic life, and so this, these two things, origin of life and, and uh, hydrothermal systems, are intimately related. And then number six is um, we're very interested in, of course, the kill mechanisms that cause the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. Um, and uh, climatically active gases are potentially a very important part of that, and so we have some results to talk about there. Um, should point out that our expedition volume is in press. It will come out at the end of the year um, on the IODP um, website, the International Ocean Discovery Program website. This was a joint effort of the International Ocean Discover Discovery Program and the International Continental Scientific Drilling Program. All the publications are going to get hosted on the IODP uh, website, including if you want to just kind of keep a running list of what publications are coming out, they will always get updated there regardless of who publishes them. So as they come out in a journal, there will be a link to them um, maintained on that site. Okay, so next. Um, our first uh, results that um, are already published was um, that when we first drilled into the peak ring here, this is a, the ring of mountains within the center um, of the impact that was our target. We have a single site um, that we drilled um, down to 1,335 meters approximately into the subsurface. Um, and the goal basically was to, and I'll see if I have a pointer here, I do. The goal was basically to start uh, coring at about 500 meters here up in the Eocene and work our way all the way down into whatever this amorphous mass is that's the peak ring, this ring of mountains that's in the center of the crater. Um, the two competing hypotheses would have had this either be limestone from the, the shallow target or something deep. And it turned out when we drilled it, we got 580 meters of granitic basement of basically pink granites. Um, um, some impact melt rock, about 130 meters of breccia, which is called suavite impact crater, so impact uh, breccia, broken up rocks, melted particles and things, things, and then about 150 meters of the sediments that bury it. By knowing that those were granites, we immediately were able to make uh, an important statement that impact cratering is in fact consistent with something called the dynamic collapse model, which is um, and these are images of these uh, granites. Um, you can see that um, they are extremely deformed. So while they're granite, they're not granite like they, they started out as, we see all kinds of evidence of faults, cataclysis, so broken up rocks due to the deformation. We see all kinds of evidence of, of high shock pressures moving in uh, to these uh, features. So these are planar deformation features in quartz shown down in the bottom. 
Uh, and this was initially published in a science paper that Joe Morgan led, um, and we have an upcoming paper that's being submitted very shortly um, by Ulrich Riller on what is the mechanism by which these rocks are physically weakened. Um, we observe some, some very interesting physical properties. Um, they're granites, but they have a 10% porosity. Literally 10% of them is, is fluid, not rock. Um, and uh, whereas normal granite might be about a percent, the density is reduced by about 10%. The, the wave speed of sound through the rocks are reduced by about 25%. And the rock strength is reduced by a whole order of magnitude. So those results, some of those results are actually coming out in a paper hopefully fairly soon that Gail Christensen is leading. Um, this has been submitted to the Earth and Planetary Science Letters. Um, let's see, so I have a movie to show of what we think is consistent with all of these findings. If I can find my mouse, there it is. So this was um, published along with the science paper of this movie and we're happy to share it. Um, but basically what we think is within 30 seconds the earth was pushed down by about 30 kilometers making this transient cavity, maybe about 100 kilometers across. It then rebounds um, upwards. Uh, as soon as you push it down it comes back at us. And I'll play that movie again for you. Um, Play it back from the beginning. Nope, it's going to play from the end. That's fine. Um, the cavity is, is then instantly surrounded by sort of mountains that reach the height of about the Himalayas, and then those collapse on us. So we see that initial cavity there, those Himalayan sized mountains, they're going to collapse downwards. The gray are the sediments at the time. You see them actually being drawn down into as the central uplift comes up. The uplift collapses outwards and kind of runs out over the sediments. Um, that that lump is the peak ring. That lump is basically what we drilled, and our estimates from these movies of the kind of shock pressures that we would see are consistent with what we see in the crater. And so we are now working on physically what are the structural mechanisms by which it allows the rocks to move like a fluid, which they have to do to be able to, in 10 minutes, go from a hole that's 100 kilometers across to um, a, a crater that's 200 kilometers across and only about a kilometer deep at the end. So it goes from kind of something very wide to something very flat, and that requires this weakening mechanism. So that's uh, upcoming. Okay, the other um, thing we're very interested in, obviously, is the recovery of life question. And by drilling at ground zero, we can ask, you know, how quickly did life come back? And what we're pretty excited about is that we ended up with this 80 centimeter thick layer that seems to record the very end of the tsunamis coming back into the crater. Um, and in this 80 centimeter thick layer, we basically find the recovery of life section. So we find both reworked things that died. We find disaster fauna that move in when it's bad for everybody else. They like to move in and live there. And then we find um, the earliest new species in the Paleogene. And we actually find life in the crater basically right away. Um, and so that's pretty exciting um, because it says something about how resilient life is and, and how life comes back um, after uh, the extinction event. And I'm going to switch over to Joe now. So as Sean just mentioned, we drilled this peak ring, and you could see that that peak ring, um, th those rocks are really, really strange. Um, so the granitic, those granitic rocks that form the peak ring have traveled something like 30 kilometers in about 10 minutes. Um, so partly they've been f fractured when the shock wave passes through the, those rocks, so very he heavily fractured at all scales, at sort of macro scale to micro scale. Um, and, and they've also been, though that porosity in the rocks has been increased as those rocks travel to their final destination. So these, these peakling rocks are very um, incredibly sort of badly deformed. Um, they're sitting right next to a superheated melt sheet. So the impact melt rock, um, in the rocks uh, that were melted when the asteroid hit the surface um, formed a big pool of impact melt rock, probably uh, 60 kilometers in diameter and three kilometers deep. Um, and that was superheated at the beginning. And the whole, um, so that sat next to the peak ring. And um, the peak ring is all this, por is very porous. And we've got an ocean above, about 400 meters above the peak ring. So we expect extremely um, uh, strong hydrothermal system to be developed uh, immediately after impact. Um, and we've got lots of evidence for that. So we can see um, very high temperature minerals in the rocks. Um, we can see, you can see there's some, um, there's some, uh, uh, sorry. There's some bands here. Um, so those are, those are hydrothermal sort of bands leaving an imprint. That red is, um, is, is hydrothermal minerals. Um, and we also, so, so, we, so we can see that there is this long duration hydrothermal system after the impact. So we have some idea of the timing. It's quite, um, it's hundreds of thousands of years um, that, that that was continuing. 
Um, so that's going to have some effect, we think, on the life that comes back. Um, and really, as Sean mentioned, we're expecting some sort of um, perhaps some strange life. So, um, so Grice, Clitty Grice, is going to give a presentation this afternoon um, to discuss some of that. So she's, she's got some very interesting biomarkers that suggest some unu unusual life at the very beginning. Um, and also we can, see, we can also see there's current life in the impact crater, so the crater rocks um, have quite uh, um, high, high cell counts in the crater rocks and we've extracted DNA from those, those crater rocks. So that tells us there's a current life in the crater. So craters can, can actually be a habitat for life and that's, as Sean mentioned, that's very important in the early Earth when we're looking at sort of, um, did these large impacts just sort of devastate life did, or you know, how long did it take to come back? Um, and the final sort of, sort of um, principal aim that, um, that we had on our list was this looking at the climatic gases. So this is now published, so we can uh, talk about that in detail. Um, so so be before um, we drilled, we had um, some, some sort of not very good estimates of the climatic gases released from the sediments um, when, the, when the asteroid hit the surface. Um, so, that, so, so we had variations, so I think these were done about 20 years ago. We have orders of magnitude variations in the amount of sulfur that was going to be released from evaporites and in the amount of carbon dioxide that was released from the carbonates. Um, so so, so we've re we now know sort of quite a lot more about, um, we know quite a lot of things better than we knew 20 years ago. So we've got improvements in our hydrocodes, we've got improvements in our equations of state, um, we know a little bit more about what pressures um, the sediments get degassed at, so we can sort of constrain our estimates a bit better. And we also um, are fairly confident we know the impact angle and direction. Um, and that has quite a dramatic effect on the amount of um, sediments released. Um, so, so basically, um, what you're looking at here in that colour plot, um, that shock pressures within the target rot, Rocks, so you can see that they're over in the centre there. They're over 200 gigapascals, um, and that's the red arrow shows the direction uh, of impact. You can see that those shock pressures are asymmetric, so so most of the degassing of the sediments happens in the downrange direction. Um, so so the the maximum so the the sediments degas at about start to degas degas at about 25 gigapascals and they completely degas at pressures of about 125 gigapascals. So you can see um, that the direction of impact is very important because it changes exactly the amount of um, sediments that are degassed um, by this impact. Also, the direction is important because um, the sediments in the southwest direction, the sediments that were degassed, um, have a thickness of about 3.4 kilometers. So they change, the sediment thickness changes around the crater. Um, so now we've got our new estimates. Um, the amount of sulfur degassed is somewhere in the middle of previous estimates. The amount of carbon dioxide um, is a little bit lower than previously estimated. So what does that mean for, um, for what happened post-impact? Um, so what the sulfur does is it um, causes um, global cooling at the Earth's surface, so the surface temperatures. Um, this particular model was run by Julia Brueger and colleagues um, actually before, the, before we released our paper, so it was, it was um, published in early 2017. Um, and she used some, a conservative estimate for the amount of sulfur um, that was placed into the atmosphere. She used 100 gigatons. So now we've decided it's actually about three times more than that. Um, so, so if anything, the models that uh, Julia produced, they probably underestimate the real effect at the Earth's surface. So you can see there the surface temperatures before the impact. Um, and they were pretty high, so red is sort of 20 to 30 degrees centigrade. Um, and then you, the plot below is the temperatures after impact for the, an average of the first year. So on average, um, the temperature at surface was reduced by about 25 degrees centigrade. Um, and the temperatures in the uppermost oceans were, were reduced to, by about 11 um, to about 11 degrees centigrade, so they were cooled quite a lot, certainly in the tropics. Um, so clearly, um, this uh, cold was was it was does seem to um, be an issue um, after the impact. There's 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 other sort of climatically um, bad things happening. Um, so apart from the cold, we also think there's lots of um, 
there's lots of dust in the air and there's lots of soot, so there's, there's also darkness and reduction in photosynthesis. Um, so these are probably the main drivers, the, the reduction in photosynthesis and the cold temperatures that, that drove the sort of loss of the, pri of the, basically the reduction in primary food production, so, um, so certainly very severe for something like three to 16 years after the impact. So I think that was, yeah, that's it, thank you. Okay, so now we'll open it up to questions from reporters in the room. Do we have any questions? Oop, right. Let's break my glasses. Um, yeah, Jonathan Amos, uh, BBC News. Uh, Sean, can you just take us back to your 86 centimetres of uh, section that has a bit of life uh, in it? Oh, Is that yeah, possible? Sure. You want to go back two slides? I guess three slides. That one. Yeah, that's the one. Sorry, could you just talk us through that in a little bit more detail so that I, I understand what, what's going on in that? Where is that in the core? Yeah, so that's um, basically that's uh, our core 40, which is the, um, it's effectively 617 meters below the modern sea floor. Um, and it's the top, if you will, of the entire sequence that represents um, that sort of first day of the Cenozoic, represents the, the boundary sequence within the crater, which within the crater is like 130 meters thick on top of the peak ring. So it's this enormous interval of material. And at the very top of that is this 80 centimeter thick layer, which is effectively the first maybe few years or something like that. We're working on the exact details of how you would per perfectly quantify the you know, what 80 centimeters ends up being, because it's almost certainly not a constant number. It's almost certainly faster or just slower as we de deposit this layer. But the interesting thing is within that layer, we definitely see organisms that we, you know, call disaster fauna, you know, organisms that, that move in when everybody else is upset. They take advantage of a stressed ecosystem. They're, they're nanoplankton that, that uh, in this case, that are taking advantage of the stressed ecosystem. Um, and they probably came back in with the ocean, right? So we know that the northern quadrant of the crater was open to the o open oceans. There was not a rim on that side. And so the oceans come back in, it brings in our tsunamis, it brings in a f and, and floods the crater, and then life recovers in the crater. And we think because the oceans are bringing back, you know, an, an active ecosystem that actually life recovered quite rapidly in the crater, and that's pretty exciting. Right, so at the, at the bottom of that sequence then you, you have the stuff that comes back in with, um, with the tsunamis, is that right? Seconds to days? Yeah. yeah, so the part that says seconds to days probably would be within the first day or so. It's, it's, you know, that's where you see the high energy part. That's where you see you know, ripples and things that represent uh, waves coming back into the, into the sequence. And then we see the material that deposits on top of that, which you could view as having waning energy within the crater. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's where we're then studying in great detail. And there's a paper already submitted now um, on the specifics of how quickly it comes back, what comes back, and what that means relative to our understanding of ecosystem recovery in, in, the, in the global ocean. Right, and then can, can we just move to, to, to Joe's um, hydrothermal systems? These, so where are they in relation to the, I mean, obviously they're below the the 87 just centimeter core, 40, whatever it is. Yes. Where, where is this in relation to that other material? Um, so that's. So I purposely haven't put a depth scale there, just right. because that's that's um, going to be submitted right. quite soon. Um, so those cell counts, those are in the um, this, the Swevite, which is just below the the shot you just saw. Right. Um, so so there the the, the the Swevite is the impact breccia that's um, that's. The first bit sort of we think is de being deposited in ground surge material and the uppermost part of it is being deposited in the tsunamis and sort of um, the, the seiches. So this is stuff that's really been put through the mill, is it? Say again? This is stuff that has really been put through the mill. Oh, yeah. In oh, yeah. In that yeah. impact, <laughs> yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. And you're saying that some of these hydrothermal systems stuck around for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we, we can use paleomagnetic data to, to say how, a little bit about how many hundreds of thousands of years. So we see, we see a change from one polarity to another. Um, so that suggests this, so that's being reset um, by the temp high temperatures. Um, so, it's, so it's at least gone into the next, basically, reversal. And the organisms that are living there today, 
um, what's sustaining them? What sort of what sort of organisms are these? If you're able to, uh, so what lives what lives at well, it, whatever depth this is, yeah. Yeah, so one interesting thing about this, right, is if you're counting live organisms in an impact crater, so this was done in the Chesapeake Bay impact crater, you know, where they found ex uh, accelerated cell counts down inside the impact crater, but that's in a crater that occurred, you know, 35 million years ago, but we're seeing elevated cell counts today. So what's an interesting way to think about that is that means it's an ecosystem that gets kicked off because of hydrothermal systems probably, but even after the hydrothermal system goes away, you have to somehow still have this ecosystem evolves such that you still have an elevated cell count ecosystem living in the crater. Um, and so we think we're getting a similar answer here in, in Chicxulub, but that's in, in progress as to, far, as to what the DNA are, exactly what those organisms are that the cell counts are telling us about. So, you know, we, we know that there's uh, an elevated ecosystem in there, but we, uh, we're, we are yet to release exactly who they are. Right, but they're presumably they're munching on something in the rock, aren't they? I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yes. I mean, sorry, if I just one one last question. But presumably the um, should come to the session, down. shouldn't I? But presumably the, the, they're the relatives of the the guys that went in there to, to take advantage of descendants. the hydrothermal systems. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I think we think that's the most likely the modern descendants yeah. of so modern descendants of whatever started there, and we're not yeah. quite sure how soon that life started but we might get some idea of that. Yeah, and they're, they're all three types of life, so they're um, that much we know, so, that, so all life is re represented in, in those, that, those all rocks. All three? Yeah, so it's... <laughs> um, I'm going to forget <coughs> the names of all three Procariots, types of life. Prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and... Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. And archaea. Yeah, okay. And archaea, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Catherine Cornei, freelance journalist. Obviously, this has been a huge project. I'm really curious about the logistics. Huh. Can you tell me a little bit about the actual drilling? You know, what are some of the slide. challenges you might have faced along the way? Yeah, well, Joe's going to drop it back to the first slide real quick, just so you can get. We did want to put some pictures in of what actually we did. Um, so the on the bottom is uh, the lift boat uh, that we use, which is the lift boat Myrtle. Normally, lift boats are used to service drilling big drilling platforms that kind of lift up to be parallel to it and offload containers or so on. In this case, we used a lift boat as a drilling platform. The drill rig we put on there, which is the yellow thing, um, kind of looking down that corridor there. That's a bunch of shipping containers that we use as our labs and office space. It's very cozy, uh, very warm. Um, and uh, that, that drilling rig is um, a, uh, a land mining rig um, owned by DOSEC um, and contributed by the International Continental Scientific Drilling Project. Um, a mining rig basically spins very rapidly but doesn't put a lot of weight on, on the bit, which is quite different than an oil field rig. And that turned out to be perfect for this expedition because that, that kind of high RPM, low weight on bit resulted in a very clean cutting through um, what amounted to about 100% recovery for this whole interval from 500 to 1,335 meters, which was really exciting. I mean, you never know what recovery is going to be, but it turned out we had the right rig for the job. It really helps that we're isolated from the ocean, so we're up in the air on that lift boat about was it 15 meters? 20 meters. 20 yeah. meters. Um, and that means that we aren't moving up and down. So the drill bit is the control on where it is in the subsurface is very careful. Um, and so that resulted in a, in a great thing. So that was two months in Mexico. Um, and then the cores went to Houston. They got scanned with X-ray CT technology. And then they went to um, Bremen, Germany, where the uh, portion of IODP that's at Marum and the University of Bremen um, did the what's called the onshore science party. And that's where we basically split the cores for the first time. We sampled the cores for all the scientists' individual studies. Um, and we did a complete, over the space of about a month, analysis in every way. So it's describing of all the layers, all the geochemical analysis, and all those physical properties numbers that we quoted to you guys were, were, were taken by, by scientists of the expedition um, while we were in Germany. Yeah, so it's a, it was a, certainly a very busy expedition. So we were working long shifts, 12 hours a day. Uh, we were, the, it, as he said, it was cozy. We were sleeping six in a room. Um, you never, you, you, the room was never empty, so you always sort of, you, you were never on your own at all. Uh, it's incredibly noisy, so the, the, it's not just the drill rig itself, which is constant. It's actually the cranes moving the drill pipes. It's, it's, you get, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> sort of all night. So it was a, it was sort of a very intense experience, very exciting experience. So, so, so every time, 
you know, every few hours you get a piece of core up, so everybody sort of, oh, what's in this? And you're sort of um, washing it a bit, because it's, it's behind, um, it, it's in a container, so you, it's, it's, it's you, you're plastic, sort of liner. plastic liner, so you're sort of trying to see what's in there, but there's often mud there, so you sort of, um, it was, yeah, it was, I think it was the most exciting experience of my life, really. It was brilliant. Yeah. All right, do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a freelance journalist. Just following up on her question, um, what type of downhole technology technology did you have going as you were drilling down? Yeah. Um, to start. Yes. We. Um, do you mean the wireline logs? So we were. Yeah. Like, what type of live technology did you oh, have yeah. going as as you were drilling in real time? Yeah. So we had a, a number of wire of log of logging technology. So we would both drill, and you'd get indicators from the drilling technology itself, like what's the pressures and and so on and so forth. But then after the hole was left open, um, as we it went off for a second. After the hole was left open, as we um, went through in three stages, we actually drilled sort of the open hole down to 500 meters, then we drilled from 500 to 700, and then we drilled from 700 to the end. Each time when we stopped and had a moment, we would pull the drill string out, and we would take that open hole, and we would put tools down the hole. So we, we were able to measure things like the velocity, the sound velocities of the rocks, the resistivity versus conductivity of the rocks, magnetic properties. Well. Oh, yeah. And yeah, image. so we get core images. So we, we have a camera go down hole and you can you can actually see the the, the ball hole and get nice scans of it. And what's really useful there is we both have an understanding of the borehole wall, right, at, at certain properties. But then we also have that same understanding of the cores. So we can just look and see whether it's representative of what we see in the core of the larger area. And then we can map that out to our, our geophysical images of the crater to even a larger area. And that's a kind of very important like putting this single eighty three, you know, millimeter chunk of rock in perspective in a 200 kilometer crater. Yeah. Next question. I guess I just realized I'm kind of a little bit vague about what this area was like 66 million years ago. Was it also ocean? So we think it was, um, it was probably just like it was now. It was a, a continental platform. It was either close to sea level or it was about 200 meters below water. So it was, it was, it was very much like it is today. Um, but offshore, there was the to the northeast. We think that was actually down, perhaps at a depth of two kilometres. So, so there was a in the northeast direction, um, there was it was definitely a much deeper ocean. So you could think of it like a, a carbonate ramp, you know, where it's like a limestone surface, but it but it, with a with a slope to it, so that um, that northeastern direction was deeper water, which meant when you made the impact crater. The, the Himalayan-sized mountains were mostly made of water on that side, so they just washed away. So the final crater, sort of horseshoe-shaped, you know, where it has a rim everywhere that was, you know, shallower water, into the northeast where it was deeper water, we actually have no rim, and that's how the ocean was able to get back into the crater, um, you know, rapidly within, you know, within probably tens of minutes, the ocean was able to come back. Okay. All right. There's a second question: Is is what you found so far leads you to where you? Do you, did you want to go back and drill somewhere else there? Yes. <laughs> he does. I don't. <laughs> well, it would be really interesting, for instance, to drill into where the melt sheet itself is. So in the center of the crater, there's a three-kilometer thick melt sheet and probably a very complicated layer of material that buries it, you know, that tells us a lot of history of, of what happened in that early, early part of the recovery of life as well as the ending of the impact processes. And then what is the melt sheet made of? That would be a very interesting expedition to plan and, and do. But we need another $10 million. Yeah, so has, it, has the melt pool actually differentiated into two layers, a bit like the Sudbury impact crater? And was there free to magmatic rea reactions going yeah. on, so explosions at the top of the melt sheet as the, as the ocean sort of penetrated into the, into the melt rocks? Yeah. OK, yep. Hi. Uh, this time last year, we were um, following a nickel clue to see if we could find some, mm. some residue material f of the, the impactor itself. I just wondered if you could give us a, an update on that. And also related to the, to the impactor, um, I mean, Joe, your paper uh, the other week uh, suddenly kind of sprung on us the, uh, the direction and inclination of impact. And I was wondering where that came from, how, how that was worked out. 
Um, yes, yeah, so, so we have the crater itself, we have, we have quite a good idea of its asymmetry, so the impact crater um, has the structural uplift, the deep structural uplift points out to the um, southwest. Um, the MOHO uplift, so the crustal uplift, points out to the northeast. Um, so we can see that we can see it's asymmetric. Um, when we do 3D numerical simulations, so this is Gareth Collins again, um, he, when he changes the impact angle, you get different asymmetries in the crater. So, so the, the two things I've just mentioned with the structural uplift being in one direction um, uh, the, to the southwest and the MOHA uplift being to the northeast is where we get that 60 degree angle from and direction from. So we're matching, so his numerical simulations match the geophysical data we have for, that we've mapped the crater with. And he's uh, working on a, a more complete paper to explain all of that. No, no, no it's it, coming out, hopefully. No, we had another child. <laughs> <laughs> it's his third. <laughs> We've told him how this happens. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's actually, st we're still waiting on the final results for a very important reason, which is that you don't want to get this wrong. So we intentionally sent out samples to four different laboratories around the world of both the base and the top of that micrite layer, of that 80 centimeter thick layer, where we see, had some early evidence of some metal enrichment at the bottom and some metal enrichment at the top. And of course the question is, these, are these metals from hydrothermal, or are these metals from the, the impactor? Um, and so that actually takes a lot of lab work to do, um, and an enormously careful, preci precise lab work, because it's easy to get contamination. Right, so um, right now we have some early results going to get presented at the meeting um, from the Japanese lab, from Hanami Sato, um, also at Notre Dame. They're getting some results, but they're not yet ready for prime time. And we have two labs in Europe, um, both at, uh, in Vienna and in Belgium, who are also getting some early results. But they're, they haven't yet all gotten together and said, yes, what's meteor, yes, what's hydrothermal. And so we're not quite ready to tell you the answer to that. But it's in progress. OK, great. Do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? I believe we have a qu just a question from the chat. Yes. We have a question from Brian Walsh of Time Magazine. He says, does this work tell us anything about what would happen to life on the planet if a similar sized asteroid were to strike the Earth now? Hmm. Um, it, it, yeah, I think it's so, yes. Yeah. So um, I think there's some recent work in Science on H Science, I think, yeah. um, looked at uh, why this, why if something like that happened now, what it was inside of the reports, right? Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. What's, the, what's the likelihood of us, of us having a mass extinction? Um, and and essentially, what was important here, we think, is the fact it hit a continental margin, so a big, thick sedimentary sequence that was rich in sulphur. Um, so, so if if an impact this size hit in the middle of the Pacific, we don't think it would have caused anywhere near the amount of devastation, the catastrophe. Um, so, so the location is quite important, and I think something like 10% of the world is, is, has continental margins, and perhaps only 5% are actually rich in, as rich in sulphur as this one. So, I think it was very important. It's very important the actual site. From reporters in the room, any more on the chat? Okay, that's it. Thank you very much to our panelists, and we'll reconvene at 11:30 for New Horizons. <laughs>